I mean, you've been in the on-prem world, you're now in the cloud world. Um, I think that there are major issues for consultants that are used to working in the on-prem world trying to transition. At least that's what I'm suspecting. I mean, what what is your take? I mean, what does it what does it take to to actually make this transition successful? Well, I think the very first thing is identifying and understanding that huge constraints in the technical world have changed, and configuring a business without those constraints in mind. And what I mean by that is when I started my career at Accenture, I remember I got kudos in my first review because I installed, didn't get working, installed SAP in three days. Instead of <laughs> right? I mean, and it's like, that's the world we lived in where it, it was, you know, hey, uh, <clears throat> perspective, that's a great job where I just cost the company a bunch of hours because I did it a little faster than regular. Now we're in a world in the cloud, Salesforce.com app engine, it takes a developer anywhere in the world 30 seconds to get access to an the full environment. And that's a pretty transformative thing, right? It totally changes the way labor is organized. It totally changes how you think about approaching the problem. And you know that the technology you're training them on is going to change three, four, five times a year, not once every three, four, five years. And I think those are pretty structural changes that then imply a very different way of organizing an ecosystem around those technologies. Okay, so uh, if, with those kind of changes in mind, what do you say to these guys who have been so used to spending this leisurely amount of time doing whatever it is that they do, um, billing insane amounts of money, but knowing that this new world's coming to them? Because I mean, it is fundamentally um, a, a different thing. So, so first of all, let me not criticize folks. I don't think people are sitting on their ass. They're working really hard in things that make don't have an impact, right? You're getting servers set up instead of actually uh, being associated with what, what's happening. I think the couple big shifts is that the, you've got to be able to think about both the strategy, the business process, and the technology. Before, it was impossible because the breadth was so wide um, the deepest technology guys you never saw because they were thinking about server configurations and how we were going to scale and how to set up the distribution and failover. And that had so little to do with the business process that it was impossible for one person to be involved. It was kind of like, if you think about, you know, the difference between making a sculpture and drawing a drawing, a sculpture, you got to get stone and have a whole team just to do anything. Whereas now, because of the way development is, it's, it's much more like drawing a picture. The cloud has re removed the constraints. And so you have to have people who can bridge the entire spectrum. You can't, you've got to have folks that really can, when they're talking to a customer, are thinking about their business strategy, are in their minds, translating that into a business process and translating that into actual code, right? And I think that's a really important thing. Eventually, of course, tasks will get distributed, but for the first time ever, you actually can go from thought to finish to, to you know, in a real sense with one person. And I think you got to organize around that. You can't be in the structure of where I've got a hundred person team, 70 of which the client will never see because they're doing things that no one can understand. Okay. Another thing that um, that I see a lot of, and this is, is around this business of, oh, every customer is different. Therefore, it's almost like, you know, we've got to start with a clean piece of paper every time that we do some on-prem install. And I, you know, people like um, myself and Vinny, Vinny Machindani, who you know, and others have said, well, hang on a minute, guys, you've been doing this for 100 years. Why haven't you got temper? Why can't you just do this? Now, you know, there are never very, very good answers to this because, of course, consultants always want to get paid, right? But at the end of the day, the cloud seems to have changed some of that, or has it? You tell me. Absolutely. So here's a couple of things. They did have knowledge. It's called, it's in binders and binders or things, or when I was at Accenture in random Lotus Notes database sitting across the, the intranet, right? Right. Uh, the key point now is that you're right, and that I think service as an industry hasn't had any innovation in 30 years. The last disruption was offshore, but that wasn't an innovation. It was more of a labor disruption. And the key point is, like, we look at every, so first of all, for example, we manage every project through our same central interest. Our project management at Aperio is multi-tenant. So right. that means apples to apples, we're measuring, are we getting better at doing the same project year over year? And you get you get better because of process and knowledge, but ultimately you get better because of IP. You're taking something that used to take hours and you're turning it into code that takes less hours, right? Because you can reuse the asset. So developing and building assets, even ranging from you know reusable components all the way to things that feel like full products, to me is a critical aspect of the next generation. And so for us, we look at that as saying, this is a mechanism why, where we can drop the cost year over year for a customer and actually make more money in the process. Because instead of spending 12 hours, we're spending an hour because there's you know, a technology asset we can reuse. We share that value with the customer. And so it's a, it, it done right, 
it's a better situation for both the customer and the service provider. The mentality we drive to the team is, look, SaaS solutions, for example, are getting better every three months without the customer doing anything. Aperio, our services should get better for the customer every three months without the customer doing anything. Our institutional knowledge should be building so that, you know, like you said, we're the experts. We should be able to do the same things again and again. And that actually leaves more time for the custom things that actually differentiate a business versus the standard things that really should be 80% out of the box, even if they're not 100. And I think that's another big gap is when, when I was at Web Methods, we integrated SAP to SAP and made hundreds of millions of dollars doing it, right? That right. statement doesn't seem to make as much sense anymore because there's a standard runtime in place at customers with cloud solutions and service partners need to take advantage of that. Okay, so final question to you, Narendra, because I know you're busy today. Um, the, the perceived thinking, at least what I'm seeing is, you know what, if you want to build this kind of organization, if you want to have this kind of uh, new generation of consultant, you've got to kind of think in terms of um, attracting, you know, the, the Apple kind of developers or what have you. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'm not certain that somebody who builds Angry Birds is necessarily going to understand what it means to, to build and integrate, you know, uh, Salesforce, Workday, whatever else um, in, in a business environment. What do you say to that? Well, I think the first thing is that there's actually been a controversy recently in the U.S. where Mayor Bloomberg had said, I'm going to learn to code. And then some people said, that makes no sense for a mayor of a city to be learning to code. And it sparked actually an interesting conversation. And from my perspective, one of the things that's happened, again, because the, the cost has, has dropped so much, you've got a different developer dynamic. So, for example, I'm not the world's best basketball player, but because of the fact that I've played basketball on the street corner growing up, I have an appreciation for what's good and bad for talent a completely different sentiment. And so I do believe that this kind of ability to actually be productive with development across more people ultimately makes better consumers, better managers. And I think that's a really important part of the mechanism. Like you can't be this, you know, stereotypical GSI partner in a suit who hasn't seen the technology in 40 years, but is telling you about what you need to do to innovate your business process. That absolutely doesn't work. You've got to be closer to it than before. So I don't think you need to attract the Angry Bird developers, but you definitely have to be able to step in the developer's shoe because it's it's not like building a sculpture. It's easy and accessible. There's a, a, a partner of ours, a, a customer, who started a programming class for 9, 10, and 11-year-olds. It's menloappacademy.com. And he, his son built an iPhone app that you know made him $1,000 in the iTunes store. Wow. Development become accessible, right? And so you need as a manager, as a team, as a company to step towards the developer and be able to translate and understand directly, not rely on layers and layers and layers. And so that doesn't mean you need Angry Bird developers, but it means that you have to be able to basically be a better consumer, be a better manager, be more aware of the technology. And it's not about the technology, it's about understanding and common ground so that you can articulate what needs to be done. If you do that, whether it's the Angry Birds developer or the old school enterprise ABOP developer, you'll be able to communicate and drive towards the result that you're hoping for for a customer. Well, let's hope some of those guys actually understand that when they say it then, Narendra, okay? <laughs> All right. Take care, Dennis. Thanks.